it doesn't bother you that I could whip your ass in bowling and bench press you. Oh my god, is that a threat or a promise? Contrary to its title, The Boys is not a series solely composed of male characters for the audience to get invested in. Whether on the side of the Seven or the boys themselves, there are multiple female characters with rich stories and compelling journeys for the audience to follow in the first season. Episode 4, entitled The Female of the Species, opens with Billy Butcher remembering his wife and being haunted by the guilt of believing that he didn't save her when she was in need. Becca is the driving force of everything he does. Losing her is what caused Butcher to become consumed by guilt and rage, particularly towards Homelander, and by extension, all superheroes. She's a soup. Huey. Just on a fucking rest of them. Butcher pushes Huey to call Annie to go out on a date so he can hack her phone and they'll be able to use it to gain more information on the Seven. Huey is reluctant to do this. Yeah, she's not a... she's not a bad person. Huey and Annie's relationship develops further as they go on their bowling date. We get a nice bit of foreshadowing to the religious convention that becomes a focal point in episode 5, but most touching of all is the way they're able to deepen their connection by being genuinely good to one another. Despite all of Butcher's attempts to convince Huey that all soups are bad, Annie has no ego or duplicitous intentions with her newfound fame and platform. Her corporate bosses want to send her to make an appearance at this religious event, but Annie makes it clear that she's not trying to push religious dogma on people and instead wants to help teens and will be donating her appearance fee to charity. You are literally the nicest person in the city. No, seriously. Every other nice person can fuck off and go home. Their interactions also address the type of toxic masculinity in which some men are intimidated by strong women. In this world of people with extraordinary powers and abilities which can be used to save people from danger, Annie is no stranger to the same insecurities that plenty of women feel at one point or another. While on a date with a boy when she was just a teenager, she defended her date after he was physically assaulted by another boy. He did not react well to her coming to his defense and never spoke to her again after this happened. And that's when I learned, never show your strength to a boy you like. Huey's intelligence doesn't only apply to matters related to IT, he is able to pick up on the discrepancy between Annie's words and her actions and deduces that she's downplaying her bowling abilities to spare his ego. You know what I think's happening? I think you're holding back for some weird, not gonna show me up on a first date reason. You said you, uh, you bowled before? You wanna quit stroking my ego and show me what you really got? Huey accepts Annie for who she is. He is secure enough in himself to not be bothered by the idea of dating a woman who is significantly stronger, faster, and so on and so forth than he is. This is why Annie is comfortable enough to tell him about her past experiences with boys that were intimidated by her to the point of rejecting her romantically. The show is clearly communicating certain ideals about how women should be treated and respected. The lines between good and evil or heroes and villains are not determined by who has superpowers or what gender you identify as. It's about how you treat others, and men who abuse their power, particularly when it comes to women, are largely seen as villains by the show's narrative, while those who are kind are considered more idyllic. Huey and Frenchie's treatment of Annie and Kimiko is the polar opposite of how the Deep and Homelander treat Annie and Maeve. Up until this point, the show hasn't done as much to explore who Maeve is and how she fits into the Seven. We know that at her most outward layer, she is incredibly strong and powerful as a superhero, but when it comes to her internal layers, we have only seen glimpses of how her extensive tenure in the Seven has left her jaded and disillusioned to the nature of being 
being a corporate superhero. Additionally, she has her prior relationship with Homelander, which he is still holding over her head in an incredibly menacing, ominous manner. But this episode finally starts to reveal more of who Maeve is at the core of her being. The plane incident is one of the season's most memorable incidents due in large part to Antony Starr's terrifying performance, but in many ways this scene is underrated for how it's the first time the audience gets to know more about Maeve's nuances as a character. She is devastated at not being able to save the people on the plane and tries to help these young girls that are begging to be saved. It's not entirely clear if Homelander is physically strong enough to overpower Maeve, even if they are more evenly matched in their abilities. My interpretation of the material is that there are psychological factors at play that are impeding her abilities to try to fight back against him. From the undoubtedly toxic relationship she had with him, to the many years of being a cog in this corporate machine, she is not in the right headspace to make a snap decision to go against Homelander's cold, sociopathic assessment of the dire circumstances on the plane. Personally, I'm holding out hope that the show will eventually build things up to an epic, superpower-ridden fight between these two, whether it's because Maeve has joined the boys' cause, or simply because she decides that she has had enough of him. Whoever did this to us will hear from all of us! <laughs> Though this episode is most prominent in my memory for being an introduction to Kimiko, my favorite character, it's also important for finally revealing the root of Mother's Milk and Frenchie's clash. Frenchie has a non-traditional approach to missions and life in general, which means he doesn't always follow orders as they are given. He instead prefers to follow his instincts and emotions. One time on a mission, this approach went wrong and some kids got hurt in the process. It's nice to flesh out the history and dynamics among the members of the boys, but it's even better when the result of this argument is for Butcher to give a rousing speech about how none of them are as effective working alone as they are when they team up. You put them together, they're the goddamn fucking Spice Girls. It delights me to an immeasurable degree that this rough, angry, tormented man is a fan of the Spice Girls. The Boys is a show that has never heard of glorifying toxic masculinity. How do you know so much about the Spice Girls? If you didn't already know this, the first video essay I ever made on the boys was specifically about Frenchie and Kimiko's relationship across the entire first season. I didn't want to only repeat the things I've already said in that video, though some overlap is going to be inevitable. But upon doing yet another rewatch of this episode, I honed in on even more details to appreciate about their first contact. When I previously discussed the build up to their relationship, I was full of glee over the way Frenchie immediately switches from chastising Mother's Milk for being happily monogamous to being completely enamored with Kimiko when he sees her. Well, if you and Monique have something so pure, why are you lying to her about where you are? Frenchie notes how Mother's Milk is lying to his girlfriend about where he is and what they're doing, and this is a parallel of sorts to how Frenchie has only just met Kimiko, and yet he's already telling her the deepest, darkest truths about his personal history of being kidnapped by his abusive father and being recaptured every time he tried to escape to get back home to his mother. As much as I enjoy hyperbolically cheering for this coupling on Twitter, the the genesis of this relationship is incredibly well executed. There are so many details I didn't notice until I did this very thorough rewatch of the series and started making video essay reviews of each episode as a countdown to season 2. Frenchie notices that Kimiko is watching J-pop music videos while trapped in her cage and uses that love she has for music to find her again in the train station. You like music, huh? Me too. This is something that has been clearly established about Frenchie. When he's first introduced to the audience because Butcher wants to recruit him, he's listening to music. And when he engineers a weapon to use against Translucent, he is again 
listening to music. Frenchie's clash with Mother's Milk about their fundamentally different approaches to missions are not only a way of informing the audience about the inner team dynamics, this is also important context for how Frenchie is able to find Kimiko. He's the one that let her out. She looked innocent. Innocent. I had a feeling about her. All things considered, there is a case to be made that Frenchie and Kimiko have a powerful connection that may even fall under the label of love at first sight. Now I am not here to argue about the legitimacy of love at first sight in real life, but as it applies to fiction, this is probably one of the best examples of how to do it well. Typically, love at first sight is depicted through prolonged eye contact between two characters using flattering cinematography and romantic music. But in the case of Frenchie and Kimiko, there is a lot of context given in the writing before, during, and after their first meetings, which legitimizes their connection being so instantaneous. My father was a bipolar. One night when I was 10, he tried to smother me with a Hello Kitty duvet. Frenchie's childhood trauma is crucial to him seeing Kimiko in a cage and his reaction being a strong desire to let her out. He's also established as being someone who follows their instincts. He sees the world through his own unique lens. When the other boys see Kimiko locked in a cage in this basement lair, they regard her with suspicion and fear. They don't know anything about her, but neither does Frenchie. They think she could be dangerous, which, to be fair, she definitely is if you get on her bad side, but Frenchie's first reaction is to want to set her free. In one episode, Frenchie makes this dramatic shift from chastising Mother's Milk for his domestic monogamy to distancing himself from his casual girlfriend Cherry, whom he never hooks up with again after he gets this special canister of knockout gas to use as a last resort. My interpretation of his arc in this episode and how he behaves throughout the rest of the season is that meeting Kimiko does not cause Frenchie to change the essence of who he is but instead to express it more freely. I think he always had this capacity to be loving and empathetic, but he's been weighed down by the baggage of his trauma and opted to self-medicate by indulging in hedonistic pleasures that don't bring any sort of deeper meaning to his life, nor do they improve his well-being. With Kimiko, he can be authentic and emotionally open, and his strong instincts are the reason why he is able able to understand her so well, even when he doesn't know her full history yet. No. Let me talk to her. What if she's a Spice Girl? Even though I've spent the majority of the Frenchie and Kimiko section of this video talking about Frenchie, I would not be able to finish this video without giving Karen Fukuhara all the credit she deserves for putting such an incredible performance out of Kimiko's origins on the show. Kimiko has been held captive for an undisclosed amount of time. She's been experimented on and injected with doses of Compound V. She doesn't speak, and she is running on a lot of her most basic instincts to fight, to hunt, and to search for a way to get back home. And Karen's performance is incredible. She serves a menacing, animalistic physicality that puts her on par with the most fear-inducing scenes of Homelander. But the shift in her expression when Frenchie shares his most personal trauma with her that he has never shared with anyone else before is a crucial detail to establish this mutual connection between Frenchie and Kimiko. Karen has to communicate everything about her character to the audience without any dialogue to help her do it, and that is not something people should take lightly. Kimiko is not an animal. She is a deeply wounded person that has had her agency stolen from her. Despite Butcher's remarks that Kimiko is not a Spice Girl, meaning that he does not accept her as part of their group, it's important to note that Kimiko does not harm Frenchie when he approaches her at the end of the episode. We have already seen that she is more than capable of destroying any non-superhero with her bare hands very easily. 
She even poses a threat to those who have superpowers. Yet she uses enough restraint to ensure that though she was undeniably overpowering him, Frenchie will be able to wake up after being knocked out by this canister without any injuries from her superpowered strength. This episode does a lot to explore its female leads, but without a doubt, this beginning of Frenchie and Kimiko's relationship will always be my favorite part. Hi everyone, it's Lady Genevieve. Thank you so much for watching my latest video essay review on The Boys. This one was on season one, episode four, which as you can probably guess was one of my favorite episodes of the first season, due in large part to the fact that Kimiko is my favorite character. I know, I'm so predictable. If you have not already seen my other video essay reviews on The Boys, I will be linking a playlist in the pinned comment of this video that contains all of the videos that I have done up until this point, so feel free to browse through them if you have not done so already. Don't forget to like and comment in order to help out my channel and and also subscribe so you don't miss any of my future uploads, some of which will still be about the boys. If you are watching this video right when it gets uploaded, then obviously you know I still have a few more episodes to do of season one. You can also follow me on social media platforms, including Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero, in order to get more of my running commentary on whatever fiction it is that I am consuming. See you in the next one. Bye.